Some wheat and hulled barley was made to taste like honey. The nomad ate it and didn't recognize what was in it. Sumerian Tablet Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank everyone who's been continuing to listen, and for anyone new, please uh, hope you enjoy as well. So, uh, this is uh, a continuation of, I guess, Season 3 is what you'd call it. Um, The last main episode was about animal domestication, uh, and this week's is um, about plant domestication. Um, I will, of course, still be doing our kind of Halloween special episode. Um, I'm not sure which of the two will come out first, but one will come out Monday morning, and the other will probably either come out Monday evening or Tuesday morning. I haven't quite uh, decided on the schedule yet. But uh, regardless, you'll have two episodes this week for listening and uh, that kind of stuff. So, Also, I did begin a YouTube channel. Uh, what this is is just going to be places for me to put up recordings on YouTube. That's another place people can listen at. Um, it, right now, the only thing that's going to be on there is just these audio episodes uh, that I've kind of re-uploaded there. Uh, I've been putting them out kind of piecemeal, uh, one a day. YouTube limits you on how much you can update if you're not like a partner or whatever. But um, it's going to take a little while for us to catch up. But eventually, it will release weekly there the same as this does. And I may do some other stuff on there at some point. Who knows, but uh, regardless, that's available for those that have like a YouTube account or use, use YouTube regularly. So, But enough of the kind of the business of the podcast, for lack of a better term. And uh, let's go ahead and get to the meat or, well, meat's probably not the best term for this episode, but let's go ahead and just get to the, the heart of the episode as it were. So, um, the last time in the main podcast, we discussed animal domestication first, because I think that we were consciously trying to change them first, but that is kind of an open question uh, of, of which of the two, plants or animals, we radically altered first. Um, I read a few different articles on this subject, just doing research for the two, um, But without things like gene gene editing or something like that, um, like a new strain of crop can be created and grown in around 20 years or so. Whereas I think the last couple of animals we have domesticated, which are foxes and hedgehogs, um, they can that took a little longer. I think it was around 40 years for foxes and around 30-ish for hedgehogs. Though those hedgehog numbers are a bit of a guess, uh, and there are caveats to it, mainly that there wasn't like a single unified attempt that was kind of done by breeders over, you know, a couple, couple of uh, decades. Um, so the those hedgehog numbers are a bit of a guess, and again, there are caveats to it. Uh, Now, we also need to keep in mind that these numbers are based on studies of people starting out with this goal of domestication in mind. They had a plan for this to happen and followed through with it. Uh, That was not the case for our ancestors. Another factor to keep in mind is that the animals they were breeding usually took longer to mature and breed, whereas foxes and hedgehogs can be born and mate within a year or so. Um... They were also bred with only the purpose of being tame pets in mind. There were no additional uses needed. Um, So I think it is safe to assume that while our domestication of plants started a little bit later, it had much more immediate results. Uh, In fact, there is evidence that we were eating the ancestors of our modern crops well before we began to, to try and control them while we were already living nearby and you know, those semi-sedentary communities. Uh, An interesting fact about hedgehogs. uh, This is actually the second time hedgehogs have been domesticated. The ancient Romans did that as well. Um, 
in fact, in addition to meat, uh, they were used for uh, quills. Like their their spines were used to create uh, some types of writing tools. Uh, but they fell out of favor for one reason or another, and I guess they just lost the the breeding stock, as it were. <clears throat> so. Now, the first two crops we have evidence of cultivating, and by this, I think it might be easier to kind of think of it more as like horticulture than agriculture, like they're just more tending things. Um, but those those crops are barley and oats. Now, today, barley is in the top, you know, still in the top five kinds of grains grown, um, but it is actually mostly used as fodder for animals. Uh, but at the time we're discussing it, it's probably more likely for us to use it as a base for things like stews and soups. Uh, and bread as well. I think we have bread that's you know, made uh, somewhere between fifteen to 14,500 years ago. Uh, and that, those were wild sources used to create that. That was not like a domesticated version. <laughs> And of course, that's not to say that it isn't used for those purposes today, but in terms of sheer volume of barley grown as a human food stuff, it is mostly used um, for malt, for beer, or spirits. Um, uh, and today, the majority of oats also serve as animal feed. Uh, the wild versions of the plants were different from what you know what would be grown on a large scale for. Um, just a few hundred years after this time period we're referring to. So um, these wild crops, you know, they had more rounded grains and spiky casings. Uh, and they, those casings shattered with like almost no effort. You could just kind of like, uh, just put a little bit of pressure, they would just break apart. And that's, that's to help disperse their seeds. So as time went on, uh, domesticated descendants of those types of crops, they would evolve, you know, the more elongated oval like sh seeds um, without the spiked shattering cases. Uh, this makes it kind of easier to harvest and, and store. Uh, and make no mistake, learning how to properly store and preserve grain is just as vital in, a, you know, a step in our progression to be a sedentary uh, society as learning the act of agriculture itself. Um, the lifestyle, you know, cannot exist without being able to preserve food for, you know, long periods of time. Um, now, there have been sites near ancient Jericho that from around the mid-9000s BC um, that had the remains of small rammed earth and kind of stone structures that contained um, barley, oats, and a few traces of other wheats. Um, and so essentially what these were, they, there would be uh, stones kind of in a circular pattern on the exterior and kind of like in between those exterior uh, foundations. And then rammed earth would then be uh, used with logs uh, kind of as a wall. They would use you know, logs to kind of like mold the earth around. Uh, and then there would be some type of raised flooring. Probably wood planks or thatched grass would be kind of labored, lay, uh, layered over those stone supports like in the, you know, between the outer area. And then the top would be covered by a stone slab uh, or, you know, supported by wood beams and thatch to kind of keep out rain. Um, and this would require teamwork to kind of open. Uh, this isn't something, you know, that you would have just one person be opening it. It'd probably take a team of at least three or four. Now, and early in this process, uh, the harvested seeds would probably be stored in kind of uh, tightly wound grass uh, and sedge baskets. And eventually, of course, at least in the Middle East, this would be replaced by pottery. And uh, the cold, dry, uh, dark buildings, you know, they're, they're key to storing for any kind of uh, plants for an extended period. So... I mean, this is the invention of the first very primitive granaries. So, uh, 
Uh, their construction and layout, of course, evolves and expands as time and crops change, but they all serve that, that purpose, preserving grains or uh, crops for long periods of time. Excuse me. I have a little bit of a cold. I was outside last night with some friends. Uh, had a fire going. and <laughs> Anyway, uh, so uh, now there's no telling how many types of plants um, we attempted to control and tame as like this agricultural domestication process started. Um, but each region that developed or adapted to agriculture typically try to grow a diverse number of crops. And this continues even past the centralization of cities and states. Uh, but once that process started, uh, there typically tends to be less variety and secondary crop production drops. Not necessarily the number of like crops, like the number of different crops, but the amount of those secondary crops definitely will go down. So it's never wiped out completely, uh, but for a variety of reasons that we will discuss later, governments typically support some crops more than others. Um, now in the Middle East, where we see you know the first agriculture uh, groups rise, um, there are eight primary crops that are often referred to as founder crops. Barley was one of those. Now, I couldn't determine who first used that term, founder crop, but uh, keep in mind that founder crops in the Middle East are not the same founder crops in the rest of the world, nor are they the only crops grown by those first agricultural peoples. Uh, they were merely the most important. Uh, for, the, for the people in the ancient Middle East, uh, these crops were emmer, einkorn, barley, and then you have lentils, peas, chickpeas, ervil, which I wasn't quite sure what that was, but apparently it's like a bitter root, or a, it's kind of like a bitter, um, it, it's similar to uh, to peas and chickpeas, um, but it's very bitter, and flax. So you have three types of wheat, four kinds of legumes, and flax, which is primarily used as a textile. That's not, it's not edible, at least to my knowledge. It, I guess there are parts you might be able to eat, but it probably wouldn't taste great. Uh, so these probably became prominent due to a number of factors, including environment, yield, vigor, taste, use, usefulness, etc. So, now, again, the first crops we have uh, with evidence for intentional cultivation are oats and barley, and that happened around the 9500 BCs. BCE. Uh, flax domestication uh, domestication happened shortly after that with I think evidence of domestic flaxseed oil being found around 9000 BC uh, is what those containers were dated to. <laughs> then the next major crops we domesticated are einkorn and emmer and that's around 8500 BCE and this is an estimate it could have been a little earlier could have been a little later. Uh, then you see evidence of domesticated legumes being grown, uh, possibly around the same time as those wheats, but no later than the 7000 BCE. Uh, and from what I see, it was chickpeas, lentils, peas, and herbal in that order. But mm, take that with a grain of salt. I, I'm not super confident of that. And honestly, it, it doesn't really matter because they're all domesticated within very quick succession of one another, at least from what the evidence we have now shows. So now let's kind of go over the general process of how agriculture happened and what that looks like, similar to how we talked about taking control of a herd. Now we have been eating wild plants for our entire history, but I'm sure we were always making some kind of note of when and where to find you know various types of food and where to get the most of it and once we understood you know that seeds produce new crops we probably planted them where we had initially found them and just let nature take its course uh, over time though I, we probably experimented with some new locations that were a little more advantageous to us 
either easy to guard or access, or perhaps in areas with, you know, close by to wild game or other resources we were interested in obtaining. Uh, so, you know, slow trial and error, uh, and the, the first agriculturists kind of expanded their knowledge and skill until they probably understood what was necessary for, you know, successful crop growth, like regular crop growth. Of course, there were a lot of factors or phenomena that they still didn't understand or control that contributed to a successful or failed harvest, but they understood the basics. So, Now, to start growing crops begins with preparing the land you want to grow on. Uh, in the earliest days, this was probably done with just plain you know, digging sticks, you know, just knocking down a couple of feet, you know, tossing up dirt just enough to kind of plant the seeds and prevent animals from getting at them. And eventually this would lead to kind of a rough hand hoe or a mattock or something like that before, you know, they've developed the, I guess, the true versions of those tools, whatever that means. Then we would get to early hand plows, uh, something like a wooden ard, um, which if you haven't seen those, it's a quick Google. It's like the earliest example of a hand plow and it's entirely of wood. Um, and then, of course, you would eventually see us harvesting, harnessing livestock for that work. We talked about how oxen uh, were developed for that use as well as other animals. But uh, each of these would be developed in multiple places and times as agriculture and crops spread. So there's not one society that you know developed everything immediately on its own. Um, and each level of tool providing, you know, provides more um, usable farmland by either speeding up the process or by removing things like rocks from the soil. Um, you know, if you if you have less rocks, the soil's healthier. You know, you can basically just by removing rocks from a field, you might be able to expand it. You might be able to turn it into something that wasn't uh, that. Um, or you could turn something that wasn't that fertile into something that is by removing elements like that. Uh, tilling the soil also tosses up fresh, the, the fresh fertile layer while bearing older dead growth and it helps to um, restore quality uh, to the lower layers, uh, lower layers while that uh, dead growth kind of decays and uh, the nutrients are returned. Uh, and different crops lead to di different designs of rows and things like that. Um, seeds, you know, at this point in time would be sown or planted by hand. And if, there is a slight difference in those two terms. Sown seeds can just be tossed on tilled land, while planted crops have to be placed in specific areas or laid down a specific way. Think of like a rice shoot or something like that. And another factor to keep in mind is when this process can happen. Different crops can be planted at different times, and depending on where you live and the rain and, you know, just all seasonal weather, you could potentially have multiple fields for multiple crops in a year. It is also possible that some fields may be useful for more than one type of crop, but I'll expand on that later. Um, the next step involves caring for your fields. Now, in early agricultural experiments, this was not something that took much time. It's possible that the first fields were, we planted were you know, more meant to supplement foraging and hunting. Uh, it was done just as a way to create more sources to gather from. And that was still true to an extent even after the establishments of small town or village-like settlements for the purposes of farming. And of course, as time went on and our knowledge of what affected crops and the food acquired by farming became more vital, we began more active care and vigilance of fields. Uh, this would involve things like looking for signs of rot, strangling vines, diseases. Um, sick plants would need to be removed as soon as possible to prevent their spread to healthy crops. Another factor that they would have to be on the lookout for would be things like weeds and pests. Uh, weeds would probably need to be burned or pulled out by hand until the crops were 
you know, much taller than those weeds. Bugs too would need to be dealt with similarly if there's um, if there's a nest or something like that. Fire is kind of useful for this purpose, uh, but you would need to be careful with that in case you know the fire burned out of control. Uh, doing these tasks by hands would be safer for the crops, but it would also take a lot longer and be much more physically exhausting work. Another technique developed early to help um, with this uh, with uh, weeds is to till and plow your field early and leave it empty for a few weeks and let the weeds grow out on their own. And then you burn them out before the crops are planted. Uh, and then you would, of course, kind of like retill the soil, get that, yeah, the kind of um, the old organic material back in there to help decay and give it a little bit more fertility. Um, this te technique is kind of related to slash and burn agriculture. The which came first, I do not know, but I'll, I'll dive more into that shortly as well. Uh, now for larger pests like birds, you know, herds of or herbivores, rabbits, hares, etc. Uh, they would be much more of an issue as the crops got larger and seeds came in. So protecting fields from these interlopers was also probably another way to get food, honestly. So... Uh, Irrigation and watering crops is not an issue at, or a factor in these kind of earlier agricultural experiments. Um, fields and seeds were probably spread out in a few locations and they were probably not overplanted. Also, the environment in the Fertile Crescent where the first kind of adapters were growing crops, uh, it was wetter and got you know more than enough rainfall for crops to grow kind of well enough of their own, at least most years. Uh, now once the sowing and growing was done, um, which can take anywhere, of course this depends on the crop, it can take anywhere between 60 to 180 days. Um, so uh, you know uh, once, once they're grown and they're in, you now have to harvest them. Uh, this is typically the most labor intensive part of agriculture. Uh, you also have a limited window of time between the crops being ripe and them rotting in the ground so coordination at this time is especially important in larger communities now collecting crops from the field must have been especially terrible in the early days of agriculture because uh, remember um, the shelling covering the grains and seeds were typically very fragile and wilder ancestors uh, and you may have easily shattered those casings and lost you know, the seeds in, in the ground or the wild animals if you were unlucky or lax in your defense of the fields. So uh, the casings were also covered with long, sharper stems at the top usually. Uh, so you had to deal with that, rip the plants up from the ground, or try to use a hand axe to cut them. Uh, and their design for a hand axe makes them very poor tools for that purpose. Uh, and this eventually led to the creation of handheld stone sickles strapped to pieces of wood. Uh, and this allowed people to kind of to cut and reap the harvest a little more easily. Uh, this, along with uh, harder shells and smaller spikes, made the, this part of the harvest less difficult. Uh, cut stalks would then be gathered up and threshing began. Uh, now threshing, oh, excuse me. Sorry for that pause there. I had someone at my door. So uh, threshing is something um, that probably got harder as time has gone on, whereas the harvest may be slightly less. Uh, this is the, but threshing is the the part of the harvest where the edible parts are removed from the straw or stalks. Uh, in the early days, it was done by hand. Later, the harvest would be laid out and animals, boards, sledges, or even wheels would kind of be run over them to flatten them. Uh, also, sticks and flails would be used as well as they were less damaging than those things I just mentioned. Um, after threshing comes winnowing. This is where the chaff and casing is removed from the seeds. Um, the 
you know, the cover seeds are thrown into the air and them hitting each other in the ground or the container they're being tossed from kind of loosens the chaff from the seed. Uh, and the wind carries some of the chaff away, but the seeds always come straight down. So um, later a special basket is made to toss and catch these seeds. Um, and then they would also use kind of like a special forks or shovels uh, as well. And um, this, you know, the tool used would depend on who and where it's being done. Uh, different cultures develop their own their own items to help with this. Uh, but chaff uh, can be gathered up and used as animal feed as well. It's always a good supplement. Now, once that's done, the seeds are stored until they're needed to make food. With some seeds always being kept back for replanting the following season. Uh, that's where those proto granaries come in. But I wouldn't be surprised if some grains were also not carried with or stored in personal, you know, personal tents or belongings or homes or whatever. Uh, I mentioned that before pottery, they were probably wrapped in tightly wound uh, uh, baskets. Uh, these would be long grasses or frond leaves. Uh, but it's also possible that they use more, you know, dried kind of similar to wicker baskets as well. Um, both types of containers would have, de you know, both types of containers like that would have de decayed over time, so they're harder to find evidence of. Um, but eventually these stores would have attracted things like mice, rats, and, you know, other kind of animals like that. Uh, hence, this is where uh, they attracted the ancestors of our modern cat that we went over last time. Now, once your seeds are collected and stored, they can be kept for a while before they go bad. Now, I, I get a lot of very different information in doing research for this episode, uh, but depending on the types of plants and how well you could store or protect your stock, it's possible you could keep grain uh, from anywhere between 3 to 20 years. Now that's a huge difference in time. And I doubt much grain was kept at the maximum uh, time frame there. And it would not taste great. But it could be eaten at that point. So this allowed for the long term of accumulation of food. And I imagine the earliest days this was probably used as a stock gap in, in winter or hard times. Um, it's very possible that, you know, the first set, you know, the first few years of crops were, were kept almost entirely for that purpose. You know, while, you know, the spring sprung, they were probably much more comfortable just doing their normal hunting gathering thing. Uh, but who knows that that's, that's may, maybe more of a guess on my part. So I do want to go back to some of those points I brought up earlier. I mentioned that fire could be used to burn away weeds and pests. Uh, this was also done to help clear away forests and woodlands to make way for new fields. Uh, this is partly known as a slash and burn agriculture. It can also be called swidden farming, or uh, I think in India or Bangladesh, depending on the part, uh, it can be also known as jhum. Uh, and using fire to control land wasn't or isn't new. It's been used by hunters to drive prey or create places suitable for ambushes for very long periods uh, before we, you know, before and after we mas mastered agriculture. Uh, so, in fact, um, kind of the burnt charcoal remains in the new fields uh, were kind of often plowed into and mixed with the teal tilled soil. Uh, and that kind of returns nutrients and increases or helps increase yields. Uh, and in fact, there are still some tribal societies that practice this. Uh, they use the Swiddens for a few years before moving on and clearing more fields, leaving the old ones to be reclaimed by nature. Uh, now, there are dangers to this practice. Uh, fewer trees and bushes, along with soil depleted from, you know, from farming, uh, can lead to erosion and to weakness to things like uh, floods. Um, though it should be noted that clearing out dead vegetation does make way for new wild plants 
and helps prevent natural forest fires. So, uh, in fact, it is possible that the idea of slash and burn came about from our ancestors uh, re after they realized that um, after burning parts of the forest, they underwent an explosion of new growth. Of course, you know, in the modern setting, this practice isn't as easy as there is, you know, kind of less available land to move to just, you know, on a whim or just as needed. Um, and forests may be protected or owned by like a local government or someone who is interested in keeping the forest around, uh, either for possibly business uh, like lumber reasons or possibly just for environmental concerns. They don't want their forests destroyed and that kind of stuff. Uh, it, but that's, that's to really dive into that, we probably want to wait a little while and get to get to some future episodes. But um, another practice that evolved over time that I kind of hinted at is the practice of crop rotation. Essentially, this is the practice of using a field for one crop and then later using it for another. Uh, different crops require different amounts and different types of nutrients and they leave behind uh, different ones uh, as they grow. Uh, this increases the amount of crops you can grow before your land is exhausted and you have to leave it fallow. Uh, now we're not sure how this practice came about exactly, but it's possible that they saw fields that had a different crop grow earlier uh, cause the next crop to grow better than the fields that had had, that had, had nothing. Or perhaps they grew something like wheat in the very early spring and got an early harvest before they planted some beans or legumes that they, you know, they were able to grow in just like a couple of months before frost or cold set in. Or maybe one year they decided that they needed more of a different crop because they had a lot of a prior harvest saved from the year before and saw that the fields previously used for the other crop had better results. Um, so. We're not sure the exact process of how this happened, but humans were practicing agriculture at some level for around 3,000 years before we have definitive evidence of this practice. So it's not a short period of time at all. Um, it, it's very easily to believe that they could have learned this, you know, well before it shows up in the historical record, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, now, this practice prolongs field usage and prevents fields being leached of all their nutrients the way growing a single type of crop does. Um, crop rotation will see further refinement, expansion as time goes on, and innovations on this practice will see, you know, massive gains in some places. So, uh, especially for a number of states and peoples. But I'm going to try and go over these developments as they come up as they happened for uh, the various states that practiced them. So, um, now there is one final plant that I should discuss for this time frame, and that is the Lagenaria sicaria, or the bottle gourd. This is a vine that grows a fruit that is technically related to, I guess, a cucumber. Uh, but depending on when in the plant's life cycle it is harvested, it is used for uh, different purposes. Uh, harvesting it kind of young means it's going to be consumed and it's, tip it's kind of typically prepared like most vegetables, boiled or just eaten raw. Though I don't think eating these is very common. They don't have a great taste. So I think eating them is only done in cases of like emergency or um, I think there is some evidence of this being kind of a medicinal plant. Um, but if uh, if you wait, it will eventually develop a, a gourd that can be opened up and dried out. Um, the, um, the gourds can come in uh, a lot of different uh, sizes and shapes, uh, which allows them to be used for a likewise number of purposes. So they can be used for containers for food, water, medicine, um, or just uh, just other dry goods. Um, it can be used as a hat or musical instrument. Uh, these plants, um, uh, yeah. So sorry. Yeah, it can be used as a hat. Believe it or not, uh, if it's wide enough, it's got a, you know uh, round enough head to fit on the head. Um, there are 
places uh, I've saw some uh, pictures from Africa where they are kind of set up and used as kind of percussion instruments there is evidence that um, that they would be used for the basis of kind of like string instruments or at least their shapes kind of influence string instruments like um, something like a oh not a guitar I'm drawing a blank but it's like a um, uh, it's like a uh, more of a rounded guitar, I guess. I forget the exact term for it, but uh, uh, think of like uh, if anyone's ever seen the old animated Robin Hood from Disney, the Rooster. He kind of has that kind of instrument. Um, it's kind of bothering me so much that I can't think of that. I'll look it up in a minute. So, <laughs> but uh, regardless, uh, a huge different number of purposes that these plants served. Um, they and they were native to Africa. And they were probably transported by humans all over the world during their migrations. Um, they have extremely hardy seeds and they can last for years without needing to be planted. And they only grow in warmer tropical climates, so it's possible that they were taken north but didn't flower there. Um, and it could be something that humans didn't even realize they were planting because even if the, the fruit is dried out, those seeds, seeds still remain in the rind. So eventually, maybe the, the container or whatever the gourd was being used for, you know, it got destroyed or trampled or just damaged and it wasn't useful anymore and it was discarded. Um, you know, someone could have thrown it away just somewhere and those seeds could have taken root on their own. Um, they are is also another theory that perhaps they floated to South America from Africa by falling into rivers and then being flo um, you know pushed out into the ocean where they eventually floated to South America where the seeds were spread by animals. Um, but I think DNA testing and kind of some small ar smaller archaeological evidence shows that uh, they were the ones in South America are much more closely related to the Asian varieties. Um, and they were domesticated in a number of places, but from what I have read, the earliest evidence we have of, of deliberate human cultivation is in South America. So, um, and that's, uh, that's very, uh, that's at the kind of the tail end of this. I think it's around 7,000 BCE, give or take. Um, but, uh, that's... Again, that's we're really not sure. This one's a little bit more difficult to pin down, but now, unlike with animals, there is not necessarily an explosion of secondary byproducts that we gain from plant domestication. Not because they don't exist, but because we had already used plants for those non-food purposes well before this. Remember, we have evidence of things like flax clothing from like 30,000 years ago and evidence of us is using like aromatic leaves and oils on grass sedge beds from 77,000 years ago. Um, but that said, growing our own food on a schedule does open up more availability of food for us to kind of experiment with. We know we have bread before we begin agriculture and it's certainly possible that we heard, had learned a little about fermentation and the creation of alcoholic beverages before then as well. Um, in fact, there is a theory that we either began to practice agriculture as a means to make sure we had enough material for beer or that the discovery of how to brew beer led to our desire to expand our agricultural output, which in turn led to the expansion of villages into towns and then cities. Uh, whatever the case, the control of these sources allowed us to tinker and play around to discover uh, things like the, the perfect consistency for a morning biscuit or a slice of bread at lunch. Um, not to mention the crisp bite of a nice wheat beer versus a heavy kick of a more robust barley wine or ale. Um, that being said, so, but yeah, so... Um, that's just something to keep in mind. I don't know if I buy that theory 100%, but it does have a certain level of truth. And um, again, uh, 
secondary products. We've been using them for a while, but um, having more things to experiment with definitely makes um, makes some aspects of cooking uh, and things like that more more your uh, more possible, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, now, the crops that we engineered from the wild sources became a bit harder for animals to steal, uh, and they also began to yield much more seeds and grains than their cousins. Um, they grew grow a bit quicker as well. However, they became much more susceptible to things like weeds, vines, diseases, and rots. Our domesticated and tame crops cannot survive, uh, much less thrive, without human support and protection. Um, so, in addition to guarding against animals, crops also would need eventually protection from other humans. Um, those who that didn't understand or care that these plants were being kept by other humans. No doubt there was more than a little bit of conflict between early agriculturalists, hunter-gatherers, uh, much like there probably were between pastoralists and hunter-gatherers. And the evolution of these separate lifestyles and their interactions with each other is going to be a growing focus of this podcast. Um, it's a major catalyst to human development, for lack of a better explanation. Uh, or, well, it's it's a group. It's a bit, <laughs> basically this these developing different lifestyles is. Uh, it's a big deal, uh, that's, and that's putting it lightly. Uh, but um, for now, though, I think uh, I think this is a good place to call this episode to an end. Um, our next section is going to focus on humans at around the 8,000 BCE mark. Uh, I'm not sh- quite sure how much further in the future I'm going to kind of let myself go from that point um but i feel it might end up being a little bit different for every region and we will go region by region again uh we will probably touch on of a few of the things i brought up in the domestication episodes again and i'll expand on that as needed um but the next main episode will happen um after we complete uh kind of the halloween spooky season episodes uh so you've got uh this monday uh the 17th you've got the following monday of the 24th and then the 31st so uh we will kick off season three um i guess or we'll continue past the domestication episodes uh that first monday in november which is the 7th um so please look forward to that and we will be back to africa to begin I think um, we've kind of went around the world and we'll start back where it all began once again. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. The Halloween episode for this week, which again should be around the same time or again anywhere between 12 to 24 hours after this one goes live will be, um, it's going to be on... uh, uh, Conan, uh, Conan the Barbarian, uh, his world, uh, and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that is the books, not the movie. Although, I probably will reference the movie in that, now that I think about it. Um, or maybe I should have the movie be its own thing in a later episode. But, yeah. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you continue to listen. And if you have any kind of feedback or uh, just... Uh, you know, constructive criticism, please feel free to reach out. You can reach me at waradrevpod at gmail.com or, of course, you can reach my Twitter feed uh, or wherever I think you have the options to communicate with the author. There are a number of sites that the show is posted to that I think you're able to leave feedback and comments. Um, and please rate, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff wherever you listen to But I'd like to thank you for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.